For the past eight decades, since the establishment of the Mancomunidad ng Pilipinas, or the Commonwealth of the Philippines in 1935, and the restoration of the Republica ng Pilipinas, or the Republic of the Philippines in 1946, the general assumption among the average Filipino and American is that the Philippines owes its freedom and independence to the United States of America. Although Filipino military veterans of World War II have received official American recognition for services rendered to the U.S. war effort against the Japanese, both as conventional soldiers and guerrilla fighters, the first liberation of the Philippines in 1898 from Spanish colonial rule is often portrayed in American history books as having been accomplished through American efforts alone. If any mention is made of the 1898 Philippine Revolutionary Army, their role in the success of America's victory over Spain in the Pacific is often deemed inconsequential and is overshadowed by U.S. Admiral George Dewey's victory against the Spanish Armada in the Battle of Manila Bay, perpetuating the senseless idea that one battle at sea liberated the entire Philippines on land. Forgotten in the narrative of the Spanish-American War is that while the U.S. Army was still assembling for deployment in California, Filipino revolutionaries quickly advanced through Spanish defenses, completely blockading Spanish land forces in Manila even before the arrival of the U.S. Army's leading general, Major General Wesley Merritt. Nor is it often acknowledged that the Spanish military stations and provinces outside of Manila were surrendered to the Philippine Revolutionary Army, despite the existence of various reports from U.S. military personnel which clearly supports this point as a matter of fact. While some may attempt to excuse this lack of recognition for the 1898 Filipino veteranos, or veterans, as a result of careless omission, the statements made by America's leading military and civilian officials of the Spanish-American War clearly demonstrate a deliberate intention to write off Filipino military contribution to the liberation of the Philippines from Spain. For example, Major General Wesley Merritt, the appointed Governor General in the Philippines, made the following claim about the Philippine Revolutionary Army and its leader, Generalissimo, and later, El Presidente, Emilio Aguinaldo. I purposely did not recognize Aguinaldo or his troops nor did I use them in any way. With the kindred spirit, Admiral George Dewey, the much-celebrated victor of Manila Bay, testified before a U.S. Senate committee in 1902. Of Aguinaldo and the Filipinos, I did not attach the slightest importance to anything that they could do, and they did nothing. That is, none of them went with me when I went to Mears Bay. There had been a good deal of talk. But, when the time came, they did not go. A slightly more generous account of the Philippine Revolutionary Army's contribution to the Spanish-American War came from Professor Dean Worcester, an appointed member of the so-called Philippine Commission. While Worcester acknowledged that the Filipino forces fought against the Spanish, he made it crystal clear that Filipino forces did not fight in conjunction with the American army as allies, as President Aguinaldo had maintained throughout his life. He wrote, The insurgent force never cooperated with that of the United States. The two had a common enemy, and that was practically all that they did have in common. Listening to the American version of the Spanish-American War, one would get the distinct impression that the Filipinos played absolutely no role in the liberation of the Philippines in 1898, and if they did do something, it was of no importance and not done so as allies of the United States. This lecture will refute the deceptive claims made by these officials and will demonstrate that not only did the Filipinos take an active military role in the Spanish-American War, but more importantly, 
that they did so on the basis of a Filipino-American alliance. The denial of such an alliance by America's leading officers and officials served to justify the Filipinos' exclusion from having any say in the so-called sale of their newly liberated country under the 1898 Treaty of Paris. According to this line of reasoning, since Filipinos did nothing, then they had no right to treaty talks and were nothing more than a bunch of ingrates when they resisted the subsequent American occupation of the Philippines in the 1899 Philippine-American War. Thus, proving the historical existence of the Filipino-American Alliance of 1898 is not to be done simply out of petty pride, but to provide some sort of justice for that lost generation of Filipinos who had their contributions belittled, their achievements stolen, and their reputation slandered by the very people they considered nuestros amigos, or our friends. To begin with, it is important to dispel this belief promoted by Admiral Dewey that Generalissimo Aguinaldo and the Filipino army did nothing and had nothing of importance to offer. Ironically, Dewey himself may have unwittingly contradicted his own devaluation of the Filipinos before the same U.S. Senate Committee on the Philippines when he described Generalissimo Aguinaldo's advance towards the capital of Manila in his testimony. The Admiral reported, He, that is, Aguinaldo, whipped the Spaniards battle after battle. I knew what he was doing, driving the Spaniards in, was saving our own troops because our own men perhaps would have had to do that same thing. Beyond the Filipinos' advance on Manila, Major General Wesley Merritt's subordinate officer, Brigadier General Charles Whittier, testified to the U.S. Peace Commission in Paris of additional Filipino military campaigns against the Spanish Governor General of the Philippines, Fermin Haldenes, in the rest of the Philippine archipelago. His testimony includes the following significant observations, which can be found in the 1899 55th U.S. Congress publication of A Treaty of Peace Between the United States and Spain. How Dennis, in reply to Merritt and Dewey's notice to remove his non-combatants, acknowledged that the insurrectionists surrounded the city. Aguinaldo's headquarters are at Malolos. His troops control all the settled part of the island, as well as much of the southern country. How Dennis said, he could not remove his non-combatants. Every place had been taken from them by the Filipinos who managed their advances and occupation of the country in an able manner. The significance of Generalissimo Aguinaldo and the Filipinos' campaign was reflected in a dispatch dated June 2, 1898 to the U.S. State Department, which can be found in a 1902 government publication of the Congressional Record of the 57th U.S. Congress. The American Consul General to Singapore, E. Spencer Pratt, to whom Dewey earlier sent an urgent telegram which read, Tell Aguinaldo, come soon as possible, would report to the U.S. Secretary of State, William Day, of Aguinaldo's progress. Considering the enthusiastic manner General Aguinaldo has been received by the natives and the confidence with which he already appears to have inspired Admiral Dewey, it will be admitted, I think, that I did not overrate his importance, and that I have materially assisted the cause of the United States in the Philippines in securing his cooperation. One should not get the impression, however, that the cooperation which Consul Pratt spoke of was merely two independent military forces fighting a common enemy, as Worcester asserted. Although Filipino revolutionaries initially did fight mostly on land, while the American Navy did the same at sea, especially in the first months of the Spanish-American War, when the U.S. Army finally began arriving, we see in communications exchanged between Generalissimo Aguinaldo and the generals of the American Army a more direct and joint participation in land operations between the Filipino and American armies. Of course, Major General Wesley Merritt denied this 
and as mentioned earlier, claimed to not have used Aguinaldo or his troops in any way. But we see in a series of telegrams and letters among his subordinate officers that he did in fact utilize the Philippine Revolutionary Army during the war. In a letter dated July 19, 1898, which was also published in the 1902 Congressional Record of the 57th U.S. Congress, Brigadier General Thomas Anderson requested assistance from Generalissimo Aguinaldo in the following matter. Señor Don Emilio Aguinaldo, Commanding General, Philippine Forces. General, Major J. F. Bell, United States Army, was sent by Major General Wesley Merritt to collect for him, by the time of his personal arrival, certain information concerning the strength and positions of the enemy and concerning the topography of the country surrounding Manila. I would be obliged if you would permit him to see your maps and place at his disposal any information you may have on the above subjects, and also give him a letter or pass addressed to your subordinates which will authorize them to furnish him with any information they can on these subjects, and to facilitate his passage along the lines upon a reconnaissance around Manila on which I propose to send him. I remain with great respect, your obedient servant, Thomas M. Anderson, Brigadier General. U.S. Volunteers Commanding. Shortly thereafter, in a telegram dated August 10, 1898, which was published in the 1899 Annual Reports of the War Department, General Anderson made yet another request from Aguinaldo. This time, however, his request was more substantial. General Emilio Aguinaldo, Will Your Excellency consent to my occupation of the entrenchment facing blockhouse number 14, on the road from Pasay to Singalong. Our object is to place artillery to destroy the blockhouse. If you consent, please issue necessary orders tonight. I shall highly appreciate a prompt reply. Thomas M. Anderson, Brigadier General, Commanding Division. There are many other letters and telegrams that can be presented to further show that the Filipino forces were actively cooperating with American forces as allies, including General Francis V. Green's request to Aguinaldo to occupy Filipino trenches along the Camino Real, and General Anderson's request for assistance in transporting American soldiers and his requisition of 500 horses from Aguinaldo, but it is unnecessary to do so. Besides having already introduced some of these communications in my previous lecture, the 1899 Philippine Republic that America still does not recognize. What was already submitted here in this lecture is more than sufficient to disprove the false claims made by Admiral Dewey, Governor General Merritt, and Commissioner Worcester about the true nature of the Filipino-American military cooperation of 1898. Nonetheless, a critic may argue that the evidence submitted thus far has only proved that the American military forces used the Filipinos but did not actually show that they treated them as allies. For this reason, before this lecture can be concluded, it must be demonstrated that the assistance rendered by the Filipino military was also reciprocated by their American counterparts. A prime example of this involves the protection Admiral Dewey provided the fledgling Filipino Navy and the Filipino flag during the Spanish-American War against other European navies present in the Philippines. Joseph Stickney, a war correspondent and a voluntary aide to Admiral Dewey on board the USS Olympia, described in detail one incident involving the protection and assistance Dewey gave the Filipino naval ship called Compañía de Filipinas, or simply the Filipinas, when it was harassed by a German cruiser named the SMS Irene. Stickney recorded the incident, which includes the following excerpts. Early in July, the German cruiser Irene stopped the insurgent steamer Filipinas and threatened to bring her and her crew to Manila as prisoners if she did not haul down the insurgent flag at once and hoist the white flag. The Filipinas, a steamer of about 700 tons, was in hiding in the coves around Subic Bay. She was owned and officered by Spaniards, but her crew was a native one. The crew mutinied 
and killed the 12 officers. They then took charge of the ship and hoisted the insurgent flag, that is, the Filipino flag. On the shore of Subic Bay were 400 Spanish soldiers. As the insurgent forces on the land began to close in on them, they fled in a body to the Isla de Grande, near the mouth of Subic Bay. About this time, the Filipinas incident occurred, whereby she passed from the Spanish to the insurgents. 200 insurgent soldiers took the ship and approached the island and fired on the Spaniards. Their firing was ineffective, but after a while, the Spaniards hoisted the white flag. The German cruiser approached from within the bay, and the Spaniards hauled down the white flag, for they evidently had reason to hope for interference by the Germans. The German ship at once advanced to the Filipinas and said that the flag she flew was not recognized, and if it were not at once hauled down and a white one substituted, she would be taken with her crew to Manila as prisoners. The Filipinas at once hauled down the insurgent flag, hoisted the white one, and started immediately south to Manila Bay. All this happened July 6. She arrived off the American flagship late in the evening, and the insurgents at once reported the matter to the admiral. Admiral Dewey sent the insurgent ship into a safe anchorage. At 12 o'clock midnight, the rallying Concord quietly hove up their anchors and left the bay. They steamed at once to Subic Bay and fired several times on the Spaniards, who promptly surrendered. The Irene had disappeared just before our cruisers arrived. The Concord then returned to report to Admiral Dewey and find out what should be done with the 600 Spaniards captured. The Concord was sent back with instructions to turn the prisoners over to Aguinaldo. It was the first move on the part of Germany to interfere in affairs about Manila. The Germans were allowed to remain in Manila Bay through the courtesy of Admiral Dewey. They knew very well that the insurgent flag was flying with the acquiescence of the Admiral and that the insurgents had been carrying on extensive operations around the island with small steamers flying their own flag. Assuming that the Germans were permitted, under strict construction of international law, to stop the insurgent steamer and make her fly a white flag, their action under existing circumstances was one of deliberate unfriendliness to the Americans. About a month after the incident described by Stickney, the mutual cooperation between Filipino and American forces dramatically ended. On August 13, 1898, on the very day of the final assault on Manila, just days after Generalissimo Aguinaldo granted permission to Generals Green and Anderson to occupy Filipino trenches in Manila, Aguinaldo received a threatening message from his supposed friend, General Anderson, which read, To General Aguinaldo, do not let your troops enter Manila without the permission of the American commander. On this side of the Pasig River, you will be under our fire. Anderson, Brigadier General This threat was by no means a bluff. General Artemio Ricarte, a Filipino patriot whom American-educated Filipinos would unfairly regard as a traitor for supporting the Japanese in World War II, would send one telegram after another from the front, informing Generalissimo Aguinaldo that the American army was, indeed, preventing the final advance of the Philippine Revolutionary Army in Manila by force and even taking down Filipino flags in places liberated by the Filipinos. General Ricarte's telegrams to Aguinaldo are as follows. 12 p.m. Report to Your Excellency that yesterday afternoon, after an hour's heavy fire, the enemy abandoned their positions, pursued by our troops to Santa Mesa for the purpose of hoisting our flag at that point. But the Americans disarmed 143 soldiers, some of whom were of the command of Apolonio Ocampo and took the revolvers and sabers as well. 3.52 p.m. General Pio del Pilar informs me of the following. Our soldiers at the Barrio of Concepcion are not allowed to go out, and we are prohibited to move on any further. We, it was, who succeeded in capturing that place. They are driving me away and refusing to listen to what I say. And finally, 6.15 p.m. I inform you that the chiefs of our troops have reported to me that our flag at Singalong Church was removed by the Americans, and they hoisted theirs instead, not allowing us to approach thereto. Thus, 
In this supreme act of betrayal, the Filipino-American cooperation ended. By doing so, America managed to reserve full credit for the liberation of the Philippines all to herself. Yet, despite all the lies and this treachery, there is no denying, based on just a few evidence presented, that from the time of Generalissimo Aguinaldo's return from exile to the eve of the final assault on Manila, Filipino revolutionaries played a crucial role in containing the Spanish army to Manila as they simultaneously went about liberating the rest of the provinces and did so as allies of the United States. Perhaps no one better summed up the history of the Filipino-American alliance than a man who more than two decades before World War II foresaw a Japanese invasion of the Philippines and who raised the possibility of an American-occupied Philippines getting caught in the middle of a military conflict between Japan and the United States. That man was James Henderson Blount, a veteran of both the Spanish and Philippine-American wars, and whose observation is a fitting conclusion to this complex military and political relationship. We had an alliance with Aguinaldo, a most compromising alliance, and afterwards repudiated it. Admiral Dewey made it, and General Merritt repudiated it. Dewey did, without the president's knowledge, exactly what the president and the American people would have had him do at the time. And Merritt did exactly what the president ordered him to do. But between the making of the alliance and the repudiation of it, the president and the American people changed their minds. I say the American people because they afterwards ratified all that Mr. McKinley did. You see, the bitterness that lies away down in the secret recesses of the hearts of the Filipino people today has its source at this point. They had a gentleman's agreement, as it were, with us, not in writing, made at a time when the thought of a colony had never entered our minds. They fought in a common cause with us on the fate of that agreement, drove the Spaniards into Manila in numerous victorious engagements involving much loss of life on their part, keeping the dons thereafter bottled up in Manila on the land side, while their ally, Admiral Dewey, was doing the same on the sea side. And then, having changed our minds and decided to annex the islands, we repudiated our gentleman's agreement on the idea that the end justified the means. Major James Henderson Blount Ang butya nating silangan Pilipinas ang pangalan May damit na tatlong kulay At may magandang laran